Let's begin with the before lecture chant. An unsurpassed, penetrating, and perfect dharma is rarely met with, even in a hundred thousand million kalpas, having it to see and listen to, to remember and accept, I vow to taste the truth of the Tathagata's words. Well, good morning, everyone. I spent the uh, <clears throat> couple of days this week with an older friend of mine who finally decided that she was ready to start this process of going through things, things that she's had for decades and decades and decades, half a century, no doubt. And, um, you know, perhaps we can all appreciate that the decision and then this, the, the sub, subsequent action of doing, actually doing this, uh, and what it requires. So um, early one morning, there were three of us. There was another friend who was visiting. So we started um, in the closet of a, ba of a bedroom that's not used very often. And it was just, you know, one of those closets, jam-packed. You try to open it up, and then everything, you know, everything falls off the top shelves. And it was full of, uh, really jam-packed with clothes, but also blankets and pillows and things, you know, just various things. So this other friend and I brought all those items, you know how it goes, we brought them all out into the living room in batches, and then uh, she held them up, and my friend decided, you know, keep it, toss it, or donate it. And then I sorted things. And it, went, it actually went exceedingly well. I thought, uh, considering there had been a lot of resistance to doing this before. So a lot of blankets and pillows are donated and boxes of papers recycled, and, but only a handful of clothes remained in the room. Everything else went back into the closet. Um, but it was organized, and she knew what she had now. That was good. And you know, she didn't struggle making these decisions outwardly, but clearly, you know, letting go of things is not easy. And these clothes, of course, held, uh, and some of the other items held memories of her beloved mother, <clears throat> excuse me, her close friends who had died, and times in her life that were filled with fun and relationship and travel. And it's hard to, to let go of these things, for sure, um, because they mostly embody poignant moments and memories that we don't want to let go of. But we all felt good about cleaning up the closet. And so the next day we got up really early to beat the heat in the valley, and we started a garage project. And um, we were cleaning out one side of the garage, and you know we took everything out, again sorting it. And then we started cleaning walls and fl the floor, spider webs and remnants of critters who have lived there, and dust and so on, and we got a lot done. And everybody was seemingly quite happy with this. But it really reminded me just how complex this notion of letting go really is. In, in my friend's case, um, I think I was most surprised, really, that she was willing, willing to put herself in this position, willing to let go. <clears throat> it doesn't really matter how much or how many things she let go of. And I asked her, because um, I've known her for a long time, and she's very reluctant to do this. I asked her what motivated her to do it now. Um, and she said, well, you know, for many years I've had a lot of health issues, and I wasn't able, I didn't have the energy or the ability to, to organize and tidy up and call out what's not, no longer needed. She said, but she got to the point that she quite simply needs to know what she has, where it is, and whether or not it's something that she really needs. And importantly, she said to herself that she had to be willing to let go, willing to change in order to improve her life today. And those, the essence of, of her words really rang true to, in me too as I listened. And perhaps you might think this is a stretch, but it wasn't for me. Um, how she expressed this experience is not unlike 
some of my own thoughts and feelings in relation to my own Zen path, my, my own first experience with Buddhism. It, it really was one of you know, being completely filled up in a way that I just really couldn't ignore it or divert myself away from the path, to be honest. However, I had similar questions. You know, how do I get through or live with the clutter and the messy things in my life? What do I have and what do I need that can support me? And the most importantly, as I look back, was a simple reality that I had to be willing. I had to be willing to step onto the path and let go. Let go of what exactly back in the day? I wasn't quite sure at the time, but I was sure that I was willing to try. I was willing to take the step. And I needed to know, I mean, sorry, I also knew that I needed to understand that to be willing also means that you are willing to live with whatever comes of that. And once we have practiced for a while and read, studied, whatever our particular path looks like, we begin to understand some of the complexities of doing this. You know, at times we can experience something as uh, easy, letting go, because we're probably not all that stuck to it. But at other times it can be a very arduous task and an arduous path, but a rewarding one. And as Thich Nhat Hanh has said, and I quote him, letting go gives us freedom, and freedom is the only condition for happiness. If in our heart we still cling to anything, anger, anxiety, or possessions, we cannot be free, end quote. And of course we're letting go every day. We let go of plans we've, we're really looking forward to because we wake up that morning and we don't feel well. We let go of desires and opinions and preferences as we move through our lives. But Buddhist practice itself is more demanding of us in this regard than our everyday lives. Yes, we're practicing letting go of an object, let's say, but we're also practicing letting go of our clinging our attachment to that object. As an example, we open to relinquishing maybe a certain desire, let's say smoking, and we practice letting go of the underlying compulsion to cling to it. Why are we doing this? For me, it was, a very, it was very good that 25 years ago, or, or a little more, I gave up alcohol. That was a very good decision and commitment. But I also needed to look at the underlying compulsions themselves, the roots, the roots of that. And in this situation, it was important to give something up, the thing, alcohol. But in other situations, we see that it may be more important to let go of the grasping itself. That was important for me in my example, and for my friend, who was finally able to let go of clinging to a part of her, of her previous life, a time when she could manage things so well. But it doesn't mean that she let go of her past. And it's important for us to see both the clinging and the object of our clinging. And in Buddhism, it's often said that letting go has two important sides that fit together much like the front and the back of your hand. There is letting go of something and letting go into something, into something beneficial that may make it easier to let go of something harmful. For me, seeing into being able to be fully present in my own life was a motivator to giving up something harmful, alcohol, that was taken away by life. This is a feeling of allowing and, and, and relaxing into something else. For me, once I could stop drinking, or once I did, I could relax into my life as it unfolded spontaneously, without fear. Fear of being caught, or whatever. Or another example, once we can let go of a fear of water, we can let, we can let go into relaxing 
while we float on a lake or a river with the water fully supporting us, being present. So our practice affords us this opportunity to inquire, to be curious about what we cling to and the underlying compulsions to cling to it. Now I want to loop back for just a minute to my earlier connection to my friend's words, which I expressed as my experience with our practice. And in the tradition of Suzuki Roshi, our lineage, Zazen, our meditation practice, as a physical practice, is really quite gentle on us. We're a little bit lucky that way. It's one of sitting, sitting in, sitting down meditation, just sitting. And we try to find a way to sit for a period of time which we feel we can maintain. And though we may not think of it as comfortable, it is a restful, compassionate space that we can go to over and over again. So Zazen is a sitting upright, gentle practice. And it is also a practice of inquiry, of questioning. So if we think about what brought us to Buddhism in general, or specifically to meditation, we likely can say that there was maybe a question, or at least there was questioning. Maybe there was a problem, or something we were looking into deeply. How do we live this life? How do we take care of this world? How do we face the problems we have in our lives, or the problems we share with others? Various questions, and many, thousands, hundreds of thousands of questions we might ask ourselves, of course, endless. And part of Zazen is just sitting and facing the question. The more we practice, the more we learn about questioning and deepening the question. And what happens? We allow all this to arise. However, importantly, in Zazen, it's not about getting the answer. It's about the process, not the product. And I liked something that I had written down that um, I had read some time ago from Tegan Dan Layton, who's a guiding teacher and Zen priest in our lineage who has a uh, Sangha in Chicago. I like what he said about this, and I quote him, he says, you are here, willing to engage in facing yourself in upright sitting. And there is a question beyond the questions that you may be conscious of. There's a question that's in your nerves, that's in your bones, that's in your marrow. And it doesn't mean that we have to be agitated or upset about getting the answer to that question. <clears throat> the point is just how to stay present with such questioning being present, end quote, being present with the questioning and letting go of an answer. As we know, Zazen is a practice of the heart, body, and mind. And when we are sitting, our feelings, our emotions, our physical feelings, our emotions, thoughts, sensations, really our whole world arises and appears in front of us. And here we are, just sitting, upright, able to maintain this posture, which supports us so well, and we're able to look at what comes to us in the present moment. And how is it that this comes to me, you might ask? Or what is this? Or how do I deal with this? Whatever the question might be, we need to remind ourselves that it's not about fixing anything or getting a solution to anything. It is our commitment to being totally present in relationship to the question and to any other question that content, questions that continue to arise from other questions, for example. There's a beautiful and poignant 13th century Japanese koan about Chiono, known as Mugai Nyogai in uh, Japanese. She was one of the first Zen abbesses, female, sorry, first Zen abbesses, and the first female Zen master in Japan. And the koan is entitled Chono's No Water, No Moon. And I am uh, using the version of this that is from uh, the wonderful book. I just lost my page. Hold on. 
uh, okay, here we go. The Hidden Lamp by um, Florence Kaplan and Susan Yoon, this wonderful compilation of um, ancestor, female ancestors stories. So here's the, here's the story. Um, Chona was a servant in a, in a Zen convent, and she really, really wanted to practice Zazen. And one day she approached an elderly nun, and she asked, I'm of humble birth, I can't read or write, and I, I need to work all the time. Is there any possibility that I could attain the way of Buddha, even though I have no skills? The nun answered her, this is wonderful, my dear. In Buddhism, there are no distinctions between people. There is only this. Each person must hold fast to the desire to awaken and cultivate a heart of great compassion. People are complete as they are. If you don't fall into delusive thoughts, there is no Buddha and no sentient being. There is only one complete nature. If you want to know your true nature, you need to turn toward the source of your delusive thoughts. This is called Zazen. And Chiano said with happiness, oh, with this practice as my companion, I have only to go about my daily life, practicing day and night. After months of wholehearted practice, she went, off, she went out on a full moon night to draw some water from the well, the bottom of her old bucket held together by bamboo strips, suddenly gave way, and the reflection of the moon vanished with the water. And when she saw this, she attained great realization. Her enlightenment poem was this. With this and that, I tried to keep the bucket together. And then the bottom fell out. Where water does not collect, the moon does not dwell. What struck me so strongly when I first heard this story were the first two lines, maybe you too. With this and that, I tried to keep the bucket together and then the bottom fell out. And I don't know about you, but I have spent a good part of my life trying, consciously and subconsciously, to keep it all together, to keep the bucket, my sense of self, from falling apart. And we can think of many examples, I know. Perhaps it's the very need to appear to have it all together, to appear to be the perfect mom, teacher, friend, sangha member, whatever role we're in. Maybe it's the pillar of strength in the family or the compassionate animal advocate. <clears throat> it takes a lot of energy and commitment to keep up this appearance. The things we cling to for protection can all too quickly become the things that imprison us. And sometimes the worst thing thing we most dread, such as not living up to perfection, can turn out to be just the thing we need. And like the remaining two lines of the koan, where water does not collect, the moon does not dwell, in that moment the bucket fell apart, and she realized that all of her ideas about self and reality were nothing but false reflections, like that moon being held together like a bucket of her own delusions. And I have to say that we've ended up in the perfect place, though, in Zen. It really is a good antidote to our sense of self. And as uh, Merle Cotto Boyd says in her response to this koan in The Hidden Lamp, and I quote her, all the practices within Zen challenge the illusion of the perfect bucket. Zazen, the teacher-student relationship, ritual, sangha relationships. As much as I wish to appear competent at all times, I cannot immerse myself in Zen practice without a willingness to come apart." End quote. This practice asks of us to be willing to let go, to be willing to fall apart. And we can also bring our awareness to when we need to have it together when it is beneficial, when it serves. And maybe this need to let go of trying to keep the bucket together was the question hidden deeply within us that brought us to this very path.
We'll take a moment of reflection and then come back together. <laughs>